Lots and lots to talk about today. I'm going to get through as much as I can today and carry over whatever I cannot into our next lecture. Um, let's talk about a few basic things first, um, discussing the human body. And, and I'm telling you, the reason why we're going to go over any of this biology review is because we need to understand um, what parts of the body, or specifically what parts of a cell, are sensitive to radiation exposure, why they're sensitive, and what those sensitivities mean for um, cell damage due to radiation exposure. The first thing I want to get across to you is that mostly we're water, right? Mostly we're H2O, hydrogen and oxygen, a, molecule, a combined molecule made of hydrogen and oxygen. About 80% water. Uh, the body is about 80% water. So you think an individual cell, roughly that same, same ratio, right? Roughly 80% water for every given cell in our body. So if an X-ray photon is, uh, or any part, part, ra uh, particle of radiation, if, if it's going to interact with something in the body, what does it have the greatest chance of interacting with? Water, Water right? It's the, it's, it is most likely, eight out of 10 things in the body, eight out of 10 molecules in the body are water, right? 80% of the body. So that's the deal, right? Most interactions with the X-ray beam and the body have to do with interacting with water in the body, okay? Um, and there's some special properties that water has that we'll be talking about later and some, um, some outcomes from those interactions that we'll be discussing too. And as it says here, water is particularly susceptible to chemical changes caused by radiation exposure. It's easy to ionize water, okay? And when you do, you can make harmful things, harmful molecules from it, things like hydrogen peroxide, for example. Okay, and you know that you know, hydrogen peroxide is not great. You know, it's a good antiseptic, right? Because it destroys living things. Yeah, that's why it's a good antiseptic. Um, good, so we'll talk about that. The rest of the body, 15% protein. That's where we get like our structure from, okay? 2% lipids, that's also structural. 1% carbohydrates. What are carbohydrates? What's the role of a carbohydrate? Not, pro yes, you're, I'll, I'll give it to you. So, so to produce energy, right? But, but to be that source of free energy, right? Um, there's a molecule called a carbohydrate and, and the body can break it apart to use it for free energy, okay? Of course, you know we need oxygen to make that happen, okay? And then 1% nucleic acids. What do they mean, nucleic acid? The building blocks. The building blocks the, for? The, the smaller pieces of the protein or necrosis of, of the molecules. In, in a way, yeah, the nucleic acids are, is our genetic, genetic code, right? It's the DNA, the RNA uh, strands that we have that, that run these uh, chemical instructions in our cells, right? 1% nucleic acids, and those are going to be found primarily in and around the nucleus of the cell. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. Regarding blood, blood is, um, blood is about half water, okay? Um, and the rest of the blood is mostly cells, right? So blood is roughly half cells, roughly half water, and a bunch of other dissolved substances in there. Um, sugars and salts and potassium and things like that, okay, dissolved substances. But um, per cubic millimeter, you're going to have around 5 million red cells and only around 7,500 white cells. These are the low end of uh, the low end sort of average of, the, of these numbers. They can get higher than that. And, and uh, also importantly, these numbers differ by age and sex. Okay, males and females have different amounts of these blood cells per, you know, unit of, of size. So anyways, this is a rough average number for these things. You have lots of red cells and less white cells. What's the role of red cells in our body? Erythrocytes. Uh, so it has something to do with oxygen, right? Uh, what do you mean, though? You're right, but what do you mean? Red. Yeah, red cells. You said oxygen, right? Mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the relationship between red cells and oxygen? Okay. Abby, do you have any, any, anything to add to that? You had a hand up. Anything to add to that? Pretty good, right? Yeah. 
sort of like, you know, writing on an inner tube, right? The oxygen molecule hops onto the red blood cell in a very simple way to state it. And um, it, the red blood cell can then carry the oxygen molecule to oxygen poor areas of the body. Oxygen rich red cell goes to oxygen poor areas of the body and, did, and then drops off the oxygen. It can do that because oxygen can bond with a molecule, um, with the hemoglobin molecule due to the iron in the hemoglobin, um, which is why iron deficiency is a problem in, in uh, anemia. All right, red cells have the job of carrying oxygen, very important for us. We'll talk about, in upcoming stuff, we'll talk about effects of radiation that happens in chapter 42, and we'll discuss um, like things like blood cell suppression, right, and, and how that's a bad thing. Um, 70, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, please go ahead. The red cells, don't they, they take oxygen, like they spread out oxygen, and then they bring back carbon dioxide? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, um, and it, it is also important to know um, that um, you know, out of 100% of the oxygen that's moving around your body, um, the majority of it's in and around, in and on red blood cells, right? Is in the hemoglobin molecules of your red cells, but some of it actually just it exists as a gas in the blood. Uh, it's blood, blood gas, right? Um, but yeah, the red cells have the uh, majority job of, of moving around the oxygen um, around our body, like little inner tubers cruising around a river. Okay. Regarding leukocytes, much less of them per unit of space, but still have a very important job. Leukocyte means white cell. So what's a white cell good for? They fight, they fight infection, right? Do you know how many types of white cells we have? You're very, very close. It's five. We have five types of white cells, okay? And they do different jobs. Some of them, um, for example, like lymphocytes are one of them, and they have the role of, um, you know, sitting, you know, riding around in your lymphatic system and being an immune defense cell. And there are others, you know, so there are four others, and they all have, the, they all have role, different roles, but they all have immune defense roles. Some of them produce antibodies to infecting organisms, to antigens. Others like physically destroy, eat the antigens. We call them like macrophages, okay? So we've got different white cells. Don't worry too much about the different types, but red cells, white cells. There's another category of blood cell that's, I guess, less important when we talk about blood cells in the body with regard to radiation, but still important for the body. You would die without them. Um, they are your thrombocytes. Thrombocytes means uh, clotting cell, also called platelets. Um, they're good for um, plugging up holes in the body, right? Keeping us from, uh, you know, dying from uh, small bleeds and things like that, covering up uh, lacerations and vessels. And... Good. So thrombocytes are also there. They have a number of them per cubic millimeter. I'm not going to worry about that, but that's the important stuff, right? Our, we have our body and our blood. Blood's part of the body, but separately discussed. Okay. Let's go to now to some basic terms that we should uh, start to get familiar with because they're going to come up a lot when we talk about cell sensitivity. Uh, one thing you'll need to learn, you sort of learned it when we talked about radiation units. Um, recall radiation units, right? We had radiation exposure, we had radiation absorbed dose, we had dose equivalent and effective dose, right? Effective dose took into account how much radiation you were exposed to, how much you absorbed, what type of radiation it was, and then most importantly for this, the, the effective dose took into account um, what type of body tissue was being exposed. You know, were we x-raying the gonads in the example or are we x-raying like the brain, right? Two totally different body tissues with different sensitivities to radiation exposure, right? So uh, the sensitivity of the body is going gonna, is gonna to differ depending on what part of the body, what cells of the body are being um, um, interacted with. Anyways, to talk about that, we have to make sure we got terminology down. So you've got a few terms just now, right? One second here, make sure this is an emergency. Okay. No. Um, you have a few different things we've talked, a few different uh, ways to talk about cells. There's two listed here, but let me actually backtrack just a little bit because you actually had one important term given to you here. Oh, it's a yellow background and my yellow highlighter doesn't work on yellow backgrounds. Goofy. Okay. So right here, no, <laughs> right there, the word erythrocyte and the word leukocyte. What do those two words have in common? Site. Site, right? Cell. Site means cell, right? Yeah. But it doesn't, and it does, but it doesn't just mean cell. It means mature cell, a cell that has um, reached its point of, of, you know, doing what it needs to do, looking like what it needs to look like, right? Kind of like an adult, right? It knows what it wants to do when it grows up, and it might even be doing what it wants to do, right? Okay, matured, yeah? There are 
different types of cells besides these site cells. Um, there are, um, well, as this next slide says, there are blast and clast cells too, okay? A suffix, so that end of the word site, um, meaning cell, is a suffix, okay? The suffix gives us like some additional meaning to the word, right? If the word ends in blast, that's discussing an immature cell. It's talking about a cell that is on its way to being a matured thing, okay? It is, um, it is less, to use the technical terms, it is less differentiated than the mature cells, okay? Less specialized than the mature cells. For us, for radiation purposes, that means it's easy to hurt, okay? It is easier to harm blast cells than it is to harm um, cells with the site at the end of them, meaning that they're mature, okay? So blast cells generate tissues for specific organs. These are um, creating things. These are cells that make things. Contrast that against class. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so blast cells are basically new cells forming. They're new cells forming tissue. Yep. Yeah. So um, let's think. Of, uh, let me say this, and then I'll discuss it. I'll give you an example. Um, so the op the other uh, type is a clast cell. Clast cells destroy, uh, break down, recycle old cells to uh, use those old components to build new things out of. Destroy particular cells that are non-functional or worn out. Yeah. The body's pretty smart, you know. Um, in a, so contrast that against like a society of people, right? In a society of people, we care very much for our old elderly people, right? They've, they've done a lot, they've given the society a lot, and we're gonna care for them for the rest of their lives, right? Well, in the body, it's not so, uh, you know, not, not, not that way, right? When a cell gets old and outlives its usefulness, the body destroys it. It gets rid of it, right? Sends it out to sea. Um, and, uh, you know, for good reason, right? Every cell takes resources and the body has a finite amount of resources to, to give. So if a cell's being, uh, if a cell is non-functional, um, outlived its usable life, it needs to be recycled so that a new cell can then use those uh, materials. Yeah. So is, is it recycled? Is it, is it, does it break it apart and then re, and then store, store that or is it all just yeah, basically it's going to disintegrate the cell into its individual chemical constituents, right? And those little chemical constituents are going to be repurposed in a million different places, right? It's not like the cell like, gets cleared out and we bring in new components in, into the house, you know? Um, it, it's completely dis destroyed, yeah. Let me give you an example. Um, think about a, bro a broken bone, a, fra a fracture, okay? When a bone fractures, you know bones repair, right? Regrow themselves, yeah? You have to bring those two bone ends together for them to regrow themselves, but they regrow, okay? When you fracture a bone, you create along the edge of the fracture a bunch of damaged cells, okay? Those damaged cells were osteocytes, okay? Bone cells. So you have bone cells that make up the bone um, and the bone breaks. Osteocytes are damaged. You have a bunch of fracture, ruined, destroyed osteocytes, okay? So what comes in? Well, two things, okay? You get extra blood flow to the area, swelling and inflammation, but importantly, what shows up to, to clean up the area are osteoclast cells, okay? Osteoclast cells basically are your janitors. They're gonna sweep up, clean up, destroy all of the broken, fractured bone pieces, okay? And then along will come osteoblast cells to regrow that bony network between those two bones, okay? All three bone, uh, all three cell types are involved there. Blast cells building new bone, clast cells destroying old bone, and then obviously the old bone got destroyed to begin with. The osteocyte cells got destroyed. So that's sort of how you, sh how I like to think about them in, you know, in one single example. But there you go. Okay, An other terms, blastula, okay? A blastula is just a small bundle of blast cells, okay? A chunk of blast cells. A small bundle of reproductive or stem cells and describes the earliest stages of a pregnancy. You've got cells that don't look like anything special yet, but will become something special soon. And again, just to restate it, blast cells are much more sensitive to radiation than, than the mature cells that they will produce or turn into. Part of this is due to the rapid reproduction of the cell, okay? 
Um, I like to give the analogy for uh, cell copying because the cell has, to, in order for a cell to copy, its, uh, copy itself, it has to copy its genetic code, right? I like to give the example of copying um, a book, right? If I asked you to copy a book and I told you um, you have as much time as you like, right? You can make a very good copy of this, of this your textbook, for example, right? You can make a very good copy of it, yeah? But if I asked you to make a copy today, you might make some mistakes, right? There's hundreds of pages in the textbook and there's a lot of text to, to copy, right? You might make some mistakes, okay? But you have some time, you have all day, so you can fix most of those mistakes. Nine out of 10 of the mistakes you can fix, right? But if I asked you to copy the textbook, you know, before class is over, right? Or in an hour or something like that, you're gonna make a ton of mistakes, okay? Those mistakes in, in rapidly reproducing cells manifest as mutations. Mutations are repairable most of the time. However, some mutations are unrepairable and radiation exposure increases the rate of mutation. So if a cell is dividing more frequently, it's gonna have more mutations, but then you add in radiation exposure and it gives it that many more mutations and then the cell becomes can more likely become not compatible with staying alive. Um, so that's one reason why cells are, uh, immature cells are, are easy to harm is because of the rapid rate of reproduction. Okay, so yeah, an example given by them, erythroblasts are more sensitive than erythrocytes, and bone marrow, which has the stem cells in it, are more sensitive than, um, than circulating cells, right? Than, than, than blood cells circulating in the, in the circulatory system. Okay, but anyways, the point is, the less differentiated, the less specialized a cell is, the more sensitive it is to radiation exposure. Okay. Now let's go to what type of cells do you have in the human body, okay? And you can put human body cells into two categories, okay? You have genetic cells, which are very specifically the cells used for reproduction. Those are completely different, very different than the body cells, okay? We'll discuss that in a little while. Genetic cells, taken from the word genesis or reproduction or beginning, uh, but making a new thing. Genetic cells are used to create new people. Or in, in, in people, they're used to create new people, right? But they're used to create new organisms. Sperm and ova, males produce sperm, females produce ova. These are the examples of genetic cells um, for at least uh, us. The reason why we have them is to make new people, right? To preserve the species. Some animals produce without sexual reproduction. We are not one of those animals, right? Um, so preservation of the species. The other rest of the body, so the majority of the body, are what we call somatic cells, taken from the, the word soma, meaning body. The way I think about it is somatic cells are part of the body. I am someone, they're part of my body, right? Somatic cells are my body cells. And the role of somatic cells, they are the person, they are the organism, right? They don't preserve, they, they do preserve the organism itself, but the, the cells are the organism, okay? Um, that's, that's important, right? They are you, your somatic cells make up you. They are what you think of as you. The next step, now that we've said those things, now we'll say all living things are built on cells. This is the fundamental unit of a living thing. So um, the cells that make you, right, are the same kind of cells that build elephants, right, and are the same kind of cells that make a mouse, right? They are the same type of thing, just repurposed in diff different, obviously different ways, right? Um, but they're all gonna have very similar things, okay? So let's discuss those similar things. So specialized cells in the body can develop unique structure, but all cells have these basic components in common. This is not in alphabetical order. So se semi in order of importance, but not even really that. But anyways, uh, starting at the top, cytoplasm. Cytoplasm is the water of the cell, the watery medium in which the organelles of the cell are suspended. You know, we're mostly water, your cells are mostly water, this is that watery medium. 
Water has the special property that at, at a, this atmospheric pressure and temperature, water gets to be a liquid, right? And as far as we know, that's the only way to make living things. Every living thing needs water, okay? Every living thing does not need sunlight, right? We used to think that, but then we found creatures living down at the bottom of the ocean and, and next to these hydrothermal vents, okay? So we don't even think every living thing needs sunlight anymore, right? But every living thing needs water, okay? There have been no living things that we found ever that don't need water. Some living things have gotten smart and learned to, when they're not near a source of water, learn to sort of shut themselves down and sort of uh, preserve themselves, but they need to get water to start back up again, okay? You guys heard of tardigrades, water bears? One of my favorite little tiny animals. Um, they live in they're, uh, little moss piglets, right? They live in, um, they're tiny little microscopic animals and they live in um, you know, mossy areas, plants and things like that. But um, they're basically indestructible. They're amazing little animals. Um, if they, they can withstand insane amounts of heat, insane amounts of pressure, and they can withstand environments that are completely without water for very long periods of time. They, they do this in a very simple way by shutting themselves down. They basically just shut down, pull their little legs in, pull their little head in, and then they just turn into a little jelly bean and they shut down until they get near another source of water. And then they'll... That sounds just fake. Yeah, yeah, I don't forget, I forget which minute, but they, I know they, I remember hear, having heard that, they said we sent some up into space, and we, so we put, the, we put them into the vacuum, right? Mm -hmm. And then we um, see if they see, we saw if they could survive that, right? They could, yeah. Amazing little little creatures. So uh, water bears. Uh, if you haven't seen them before, I encourage you to go YouTube what a water bear is. There's plenty of people who enjoy putting them under microscopes and showing you things about them. Cool little animals. Um, they call them water bears. They're little like six-legged things. They look sort of bear-shaped. Um, okay. But anyways, um, every living thing needs water. Okay. Um, down to the smallest organisms, all the way to the biggest ones. We all need water. So you'll find that in common. Mitochondria in the body serve as an energy source. Here's an interesting thing. For whatever evolutionary reason, so you know, let me backtrack a little bit here. You know that your DNA gives you all the instructions to build you, right? Okay. Where's your DNA come from? Parents. Parents, right? But roughly 50% mom, 50% dad, right? That's the nuclear DNA, okay? For whatever evolutionary reason, some of our DNA is not packaged in the nucleus. Some of our DNA is packaged in our mitochondria. Uh, outside of the nucleus, mitochondrial DNA. The mitochondria are the things in your cells that convert sugar to energy. Okay, they're, they're, they, you've probably heard about them in science classes, energy factories, right? That's, what, that's all we basically need to think about them as. They're a thing that produces energy, that uses free energy to make energy for the cell. But anyways, the mitochondria for your cells has to be built, okay? Built out of genetic code, okay? The genetic code for your mitochondria, for all living animals' mitochondria, is not kept in the nucleus, okay? So think about a sex cell, right? Sperm and ova, okay? Which is larger? The ova's magnitude larger, right? It's huge compared to the sperm. Because a sperm cell is only basically one thing, okay? It's a nucleus full of DNA, the, the male's DNA, right? And a wiggly tail. Okay, and a little energy source for that wiggly tail. Okay, that's all it is. That's all a sperm cell is. Okay, the rest of everything that's, that, that became you came from your mom's cell. Okay, your mom's ova. Okay, um, ovum. So the point is, is that your genetic code for most of your body is 50% mom, 50% dad. Your dad gave the sperm cell, your mom gave the ovum, 50-50, right? However, your dad gave strictly zero mitochondrial DNA to you. Okay. All mitochondrial DNA for all animals ever has been only from maternal inheritance. You only have your mom's mitochondria, and mitochondria are the things that produce energy for the cells. Your dad, males, cannot hand down mitochondrial DNA, which is sort of interesting, right? You are 50% mom, 50% dad for most of everything, but the thing in your cell that makes the energy for your body can only and exclusively come from your mother just kind of cool right um so you know there's an important role for everything and uh, i think it's an interesting fact of nature that your body chose you know evolution chose to put things that were important outside of the nucleus and that made you know some 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 uh, important effects for the future strictly <laughs> strictly speaking that your dad can't give you mitochondria okay all from your mom it's kind of cool um so mom definitely accounts for more than 50 percent then right <laughs> if you include the mitochondria okay good 
So, um, all right, next up, ribosomes. Ribosomes have this job of, of, of um, taking what was brought out of the nucleus, the information brought out of the nucleus, and sort of putting it together, okay? Um, we'll talk more about that in a little bit, but it's manufacture of proteins. Proteins are what the body needs to build to make things. You will also have in the cell lysosomes, lice meaning to break down. Um, lysosomes are breakdown, waste removal, janitors. Endoplasmic reticulum, big phrase, all it means is it's a series of tubes, okay? It's a series of tubes through the water, that through the cytoplasm, that gets things out of the cell. It's a way to transport around the cell and then get things out of the cell. You know, you just made this fancy pants antibody inside of your cell, right? And then your cell has to get it out to the body, yeah? These system of tubes will do that. Cell membrane, very important. It's the thing that separates outside from inside, right? It's a uh, uh, double layer made of molecules of phosphorus and uh, lipids. Uh, phospholipid bilayer is what we call it. And it basically, it's very smart. It uh, keeps the outside out and the inside in. And um, it's one of the first things that cells ever had. It's what made cells a cell versus just a bunch of molecules floating around, right? Once you had a way to encumbrance the information that the, the cell contained, then you have an individual thing, right? The, the membrane gives us the ability to have individual units of life. Without a cell membrane, there is no cell, right? It's just a bunch of molecules floating around. Um, so, and then the function is containment. Nucleus and nucleoli. Nucleus is the control center. I, I like to use the analogy of a library, right? Um, the, the nucleus is where we keep all the information and same with libraries, right? Uh, libraries store the information in a very particular way, right? You do not just walk into the library and find a pile of letters, right? And then have to like pick, pick out the letters and form the book you want to read, right? It's very organized, right? You've got the, you know, the Dewey Decimal System and the books are all put in very specific ways, right? And you can go get exactly what you need to get because you know where exactly where it's at, yeah? Very similarly in our cells, our cells are not just a pile of genetic information. They're very specifically packaged in a way that can be, um, that can be kept from damage as much as possible, but then be accessed to, um, to uh, make copies of. And nucleoli produce ribosomes. You learn that ribosomes up, where'd they go? Where are they? They're right here, okay. Ma uh, function and manufacture of proteins. Okay. So this is the picture. This is about, um, you know, this is a general picture of a body cell, right? Remember, all body cells specialize and they all have different shapes and sizes and they sit in different amounts of layers and things like that. But they all have these things in common. Um, and most importantly for us, there's a few most important things for us. Most important things for us are going to be the nucleus and what's inside, okay? The water of the cell cytoplasm, and then the cell's membrane. Those are our like three most important parts of the cell when it comes to being able to discuss what happens due to radi uh, when, when um, cells are exposed to radiation. But there you go. You've got all of those things shown there. Okay. Let's move forward. All right, quick little one slide review of uh, what we call metabolism. Um, let me back up. Before we say that, what does metabolism mean to you? Breaking down. Breaking down, um, and what, what are you thinking, Joe? Like food to energy. Food to energy, right? Storing. Good, good, good. Um, where do we get food from? China. Well, we produce, we have to we have to get it from outside the body, right? We have to get it from our environment. Okay, we cannot. Um, you know, if you think about it as a as a as a thermal system, right? As a system that produces heat. If you just leave us alone, we will come to thermal equilibrium with the room around us in a few days or weeks. If you just leave us alone, right? If you don't feed us and water us, right? We will stop functioning. We will cool down, and our bodies will die, and we'll come to the same temperature as the room around us, right? However, we don't. We are not. If you measure your temperature right now, you are not the same temperature as the room around you, right? You, per, you are hotter than the room around you. That heat came from energy, okay? You, the energy wasn't free, okay? You had to get that energy and put it into your body, okay? You had to eat food, right? And then a process in your body had to happen in which you took that food and broke it down and used the free energy from it to heat yourself up, okay? 
Um, think about yourself as a thermal system in that way, right? You are maintaining your temperature and the, that requires energy, okay? The energy is from the outside world and we have to process that energy. That's what, we, that's what metabolism really is at, at some level. Now, let me give you three different types of, meta three different types of metabolic processes. Um, the word metabolism is just the net sum of all chemical interactions within the cell. Okay, and if you think about the cell, right, a single cell, put energy in, energy comes out, right? And if you just monitored energy going in, energy going out, that from the outside, that's what you could call metabolism. Energy in and energy out, that's the metabolic processes. It's happening because of chemical interactions within the cell. Now, within the cell, different types of, of, of metabolic processes are gonna, are gonna take place anabolism and catabolism okay anabolic processes take the molecules from the things that you ate and process them turning them into larger molecules with um, with intentional design right um, think of um, adenosine triphosphate if you took science class you remember ATP okay ATP is the energy source for like your muscles right well, it's not, it's not just, it doesn't just float around. I mean, it does float around once your body makes it, but your body has to make it first, okay? So you ate some food, and then um, your body has to build ATP for your, for your body to use it, okay? It needs this molecule, okay? It had to build it, though. That's anabolism, okay? Before anabolism can take place, catabolism has to take place. The food that you ate has to be digested. That's not catabolism. But the food that you ate gets digested, gets into the cells of your body, the proteins, the sugars get into the cells of your body, and your body then breaks down those larger molecules so that it can use those individual building blocks, those Lego pieces, to build larger molecules out of. Catabolism is that process. So anabolism and catabolism, those are the two things that are happening inside of the cell, break down and build up okay, of, of molecules breakdown of the free molecules that we got to build new molecules that we'll use, okay? And the whole process is referred to as metabolism. Everyone okay with that? So it's okay if you just remember metabolism, but there is two things that are happening within that inside of the cell. Cells produce uh, lots of things, but importantly, cells produce proteins. Um, the type of proteins that the cell produces determines what the cell does. Um, and this information gets transferred from nucleus to ribosomes through the endoplasmic reticulum and the cell then builds its new thing outside of the nucleus to keep the cell running. Okay. 